ಲೈವ್ ಯೂಟ್ಯೂಬ್ ಲೈವ್ ಕೊಟ್ಟೇನ್ ರೀ ಅದೇ ನಮ್ಮ ಇರ್ತಾರೆ ಅಲ್ಲೊಂದು ಇಲ್ಲೊಂದು ಆಪ್ಷನ್ ಇರ್ತಾರೆ ಮೂರು ಡಾಟ್ ಇರ್ತಾವ ನಾವು ಮೊದಲೇ ಸೆಟ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಒಳಗೆ ಹಾಕೊಟ್ಬಿಡ್ರಿ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಬರ್ತಾರೆ ಬಹಳ ಬೆಸ್ಟ್ ಅದ ಇದು ನಾನು ಮಾಡ್ತೀನಿ ಓ ಅದ್ರಾಗ ಆಫ್ ಮಾಡಿದ್ದೀನಿ ಆಫ್ ಮಾಡ್ಬೇಕು ಎರಡು ಕಡೆ ಬರ್ತಾವ್ರಿ ವಾಯ್ಸ್ ಅಡ್ವೊಕೇಟ್ ಸಂತೋಷ ಯಾಕೆ ಆಗ್ತಾ ಇಲ್ಲ ಅಡ್ವೊಕೇಟ್ ಜಯನಗರ ಆಡಿಯೋ ಕನೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆಗ್ತಾರೆ ಕನೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆಗ್ತಾ ಆಡಿಯೋ ವಿಡಿಯೋ ಥಾಮ ಗ ತಿಳಿ ಕರ್ತೆ ಸರ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಸರ್ ಎಸ್ 
Yes, sir. अरे नाम जरा माजे चेंबर माजे माजा कोट है जरा क्योंकि अरे चेंबर में ये माजा कोट है तो अरे तो बस आह वीडियो भी तो क्या ऐड कर दी ये अच्छा हाँ कर कर Yes, sir. 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 I, 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 I. Yes, sir. I, I am saying you, and I will allow you to share, sir. Okay, now. Okay, okay. Right, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. He's also got that. Okay. Okay. बड़ा अच्छा है जी देर वेरी पॉवरफुल मिनट है आउट द आरे कनेक्ट करते हैं हाँ आउट क्या आने का इस फोटो में आउट है ना सर आई एनेबल्ड यू टू शेयर योर स्क्रीन सर प्रिंसिपल जयसिया I think you have to un unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I am hearing you, sir. I am hearing you. I think uh, one minute, sir. Sir, can you hear me now? Sir, can you hear me? Hello, sir. Yeah, uh, can you 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 can hear me on the screen, right? Yes, sir. I am. Yeah, but I can't. Yes, I can't hear you. So you have to unmute yourself. Yes, yes, sir. I am. Yes, sir. Hundred percent. Can you hear? Can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, sir? I can hear you as well now. 
संग्राम पाटिल Yes, 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 yes. You know him. Yeah, so <laughs> he's from my club. Yes, sir. We are, we are in road. Yes, right. yes, yes. <laughs> That's what uh, I told him, and he said yes. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, probably in the month of March we come there for our district conference. Oh yes, yes. Hope yeah. it will be physical. <laughs> yes, sir. No, actually, we 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 he planned it in Sri Lanka, but because of this yes. pandemic, yeah, uh, we have come to yes, yes. yeah, well, I think Sayaji Hotel. Uh, yes, Sayaji. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. Now I shifted to Belgaum, sir. Now I am in uh, Belgaum South Club, Belgaum uh, Rotary Club, Belgaum South Club. Uh, I am the. I was president last year again, second time president again. <laughs> second time. Second time president of the club, sir, Rotary Club. Wow, wow! In Belgaum now. Belgaum now. Uh, wow. Earlier I was a chikodi. You came to our Rotary Club also. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes when our advocate Bolas was. Uh, Yes, uh, I think he was president or secretary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we shall begin it in a couple of minutes, sir. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So you I'll, tell me. I'm and uh, even uh, we are giving live uh, stream on YouTube also. It's going on YouTube. I see. Okay, yeah. okay. That's good. So those who cannot come here, they can uh, go and join there. So when do you uh, think your physical? Uh, classes and uh, sir uh, right now we are sorry. we are with online classes only because government of karnataka they have permitted us to go with uh, offline classes from 17th december but there is uh, the sop is very strict because the student has to get uh, covid test and even teachers have to get covid test uh, but students are hesitating to get uh, the test that's the reason why students are not coming Hardly oh. some three or four people are coming, but we are continuing with online only. Right now, right, that's right. Uh, we are continuing because uh, uh, even exams are going on for the last year batch now. That's why we are not uh, taking any risk here. But of course, now the cases have come down yeah. uh, to a large extent. Hardly in Belgaum it is around ten to twelve or like that only. Oh. And in Just hoping second wave there. should not. Uh... Uh, sir, I think there is no second attack. wave, sir. I think the second wave is a what you call is a product of uh, it is create second wave is uh, created by this uh, media. <laughs> media. <laughs> <laughs> I I was uh, because I I was asking some of my doctor's friends here. They said uh. there cannot be a second wave like, like second wave. Hope so. <laughs> uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. What's that guy? Last kid. Sir, we begin, sir. We we commence with it, sir. Okay. Okay. Right. Mansi, Mansi, yeah. Can you start now? You want to yes. you want to make a beginning, uh, Principal Jaisya? Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, yeah. we want a beginning because we have yeah. some ceremonious uh, commencement. Ah, uh, just give me a, one minute. Just one. Yeah. Minute. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, Sanjay, bola. Huh? निखिल Knowledge is power. Information is liberating. Education is the premises of progress in every society. In a very good afternoon to one and all present here. I, Mansi Mangalika, student of BV Ballad Law College, extend humble salutation to my, to the distinguished guests, my beloved teachers, 
and all the participants who have logged in today for this webinar on this auspicious occasion of the Constitution Day. May I now request respected Principal Sir Shri Dr. B. J. Simma to formally commence the program by welcoming the guests and all the participants. Uh, thank you, Mansi. Uh, uh, respected uh, the guest speaker and uh, my good old friend, Dr. Advocate uh, uh, Santosh Shah from Kolhapur, and all the participants who have uh, joined this webinar on this very auspicious occasion of uh, Constitution Day. Uh, friends, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar. Uh, as we are celebrating the 71st uh, uh, year of our adoption of our Indian Constitution, uh, a landmark day in our <laughs> national <laughs> calendar. And I, uh, I especially thank uh, uh, to advocate Dr. Santosh Shah, a renowned advocate and an academician in law, and more than that, an expert in Indian constitution and above all, a very humble human being with whom we have, I have a lot number of years of association when I was at Chikori and now I am at Belgaum for joining us today and accepting our invitation to share his uh, uh, knowledge with all the participants here. Uh, Dr. Santosh Shah, I welcome you uh, to this webinar on behalf of uh, you. KLD Society's B.V. Bellan Law College as well as all the participants who have joined here. Friends, November 26, 1949 is the day when our founding fathers subscribed to this constitutional document, which later came into force on 26th January, 1950. And in 2015, to uh, coincide with the 125th birth anniversary of Dr. Bhimrao Ambedkar, uh, who is remembered as the chief architect of Indian constitution, the government has decided to uh, celebrate this day as a constitution day, which was earlier celebrated as the law day. The Indian constitution, as we all know, that is more than just a set of articles and schedules. It represents our hopes, it represents our aspirations, and an ideal of society that we are striving to be. Constitution is the culture that we have adopted for ourselves to live in this country. The constitution is the fundamental part of lives of the Indians, showing the direction in tough times. It is a matter of pride that our constitution has continued to thrive in the last seven decades, in spite of uh, uh, the many crises, but thanks to the uh, strongest democratic values that we could uh, keep in our country, unlike in our neighboring countries where the system has failed quite a number of times, but still we could sustain that pressure because of the rich cultural heritage that we have uh, derived from the constitution. Uh, and also we should thank the flex flex uh, flexibility, the quality of flexibility that this constitution has uh, uh, showed uh, in this living document that has allowed it to be amended and constructively applied for the changing timings. Time. Today, we celebrate not only the milestone in India's democratic journey, but also chart out our path for the future. As we work towards realizing the dream of new India, the teachings of the constitution have become even more relevant. So the time has come once again to know the overview of Indian constitutions uh, rather and to have uh, the hopes for our uh, better India in the uh, coming days. With these opening remarks, I once again welcome the guest speaker, Dr. Advocate uh, uh, Santosh Shusha, and all the participants who have part joined this webinar. Over to you, Mansi, again. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now I request Savita, ma'am, to introduce today's chief speaker, Dr. Santosh Shah, Advocate Kolapur. Mansi, unmute yourself. Yes. Good afternoon to one and all. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Santosh Shah, a senior advocate from Kolhapur. Sir is an advocate by profession and an academician by passion. Sir has completed his Master of Laws from Temple University, USA, MS in Political Science from Fort Hayes State University, USA, PhD in Law under guidance of Dr. Satyaranjan Sate Puna. Sir has, is included in Dean's List of Students at Temple Law School, Philadelphia, USA, 
selected for all american scholar who's who's dictionary and who's who's among international students in united states a resident of international student scholarship and scholarship for high achieving students in career transition fort hayes state university usa sir stood first class in llb final examination by virtue of which num- he received number of prizes awards and honors inclusive of gold medal he re- he is a recipient of a university a certificate of merit as an outstanding law teacher from university of international commercial law pace university school of law usa sir is working as a legal advisor and is advising various companies associations government and non governmental organization public sector organization universities educational universities bank etc sir is a guide and an examiner of phd students in law member indian association of arbitration life member indian law university new delhi member indian society of international law new delhi honorary professor of law shahaji law college kolhapur visiting professor of international commercial law symbiosis institute of foreign trade honorary professor in mercantile law sangli and kolhapur visiting professor of legal Esper- experts of business from kolhapur university technology kolhapur visiting faculty in environmental law for msc environmental science shivaji university kolhapur sir is a visiting professor for llm university of goa visiting professor at nalsar university of law hyderabad research assistant to professor yeso gano temple law college school graduate teaching assess, uh, assistant department of political science fort hayes state university he is he is being invited as a resources person for ugc refresher course in co- in commerce and management de- department library science department shivaji university kolhapur visiting honorary professor in law ns law college sangli he is a coordinator and honorary professor post graduate department of law shivaji university kolhapur member of board of studies in law of U- uh, shivaji university member of selection committee for law teachers he is a visiting professor of mit school of government for academic year 2009 and 10 he is a visiting professor in law on medico legal course at krishna institute medical science karad sir has attended various international and national conferences seminar and also has published various articles in national and international level uh, sir is a life member of indian red cross society selected as best youth for district by jays club of kolhapur he is a recipient of lottery international fellowship to study at fort hayes law university uh, state university president and social chairperson of international students union graduate representative on graduate council fort hayes state university he is a member senate law faculty and student council of shivaji university participation in moot court competitions legal aid clinics model Un- uh, model united nations and education competitions won various prizes in the competitions international service director rotary club of kolhapur midtown he is a trustee of vatsalya sneha foundation ratnagiri with this brief universe a uh, brief introduction i welcome you sir welcome thank you ma'am i would humbly request today's speaker and our guest dr santosh shah to briefly explain the outline of indian constitution on this auspicious occasion sure uh, good afternoon to one and all uh, my very good friend and uh, as principal jaisia said our relations go back to more than a de- decade uh principal dr jaisia who is responsible for getting me here uh, dr jyoti hiremat who is the coordinator faculty coordinator professor uh, savita ma'am who just introduced me uh, it wasn't a brief introduction it should have been brief uh, i think it went beyond outlines of indian constitution uh, but thank you for a very good introduction uh, and uh, mansi you're doing a wonderful job by coordinating all of this and all the other students and faculty and 
those who have joined uh, for this presentation. Uh, since uh, most of the participants here would be having law background, the way I would like to do this is uh, first, I will, I will divide my presentation in about four uh, categories. First would be, I will just take you a little back uh, before the birth of the constitution, what all happened briefly uh, before the constitution took birth, uh, meaning thereby uh, what went into making of the constitution, because it's only when you understand what went into making of the constitution, you will understand the constitution better. Then we will get into actual constitution. And uh, when we get into actual constitution, the limited time we have, uh, I will focus on the major uh, chapters. And, uh, you know, any anyone, if you ask anyone, which is the heart of the constitution, uh, the it is always the part three, uh, which is fundamental rights, which is the heart of the constitution. So we'll deal with that little more elaborately, fundamental rights. And the other part, which would be, of course, directive principles, fundamental duties, and uh, the remaining portion of the constitution, briefly, as to how uh, the mechanisms or processes are laid down in the constitution, union and state, uh, briefly. And then I think I will concentrate, since, as I, as I said, most of us would be people with law background, on the role of judiciary in the Indian constitution. And in that, I would like to little more elaborately deal with uh, Kesavananda Bharatiya landmark judgment, which turned uh, the, the way judicial review uh, started thereafter, and how that judicial review has continued up to now, and how judges of the Supreme Court and thereafter high courts have used Keswananda Bharti, the basic structure doctrine, uh, uh, in a in a in a fashion which has led to what we call as now public interest. Okay, so that is how I think I will um, deal with uh, the constitution. We'll try to outline uh, most of the portions of the constitution, at least uh, those which are major. Okay, so I think with this I will share start sharing my slides. Uh, and uh, and simultaneously uh, speak with the slides so that everyone understands what I intend to do. Okay. Now, we all have to keep in mind, uh, am I audible, Principal Jaisiya? There's no problem. Okay. And uh, my slides can also be seen, right? No, no. Your slides have not been displayed, sir. You have to click it on them. Yeah, my slides can be seen. You have to click on the slides, sir. Your screen is visible. Screen is visible and uh, I, I am audible as well. But you have to click on that uh, Constitution of India PPT. That you have to yes. Click. You can see the slide, right? Uh, slides are not visible now. Not, not visible? Sir, sir, you have to take slide to the... First, you have to take slide to the... Uh, this one, sir. To the... To the board. Mm. You have to take it to the board, sir. Then it will... Uh, uh, it, it, it says on my screen, you are screen sharing. That's what it says. Yes, sir. You have to, uh, there you find your uh, PPT, sir. Yeah, my PPT is on. No, no. Uh, we, we are not seeing your PPT, sir. We are seeing your computer, uh, whatever your laptop uh, screen. I mean, laptop uh, that, uh, uh, folder we are seeing. Oh, because yes, on my are... laptop, uh, these, uh, these slides have started. No, no, sir. We are not seeing them. And your green, uh, there is a green signal. You are screen sharing. Green signal has also come. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, you. Actually, it says it's sharing. Uh, sir, sir, it is. It, you, you have to uh, in the screen sharing. No, sir. You get uh, this one, sir. Uh, there, you have to click, sir. You, you are, you have shared your entire that uh, laptop screen here. But you are not uh, put the uh, PPT there. You have to first your uh, you put the PPT there, sir. You open your PPT uh, outside the uh, what do you call this Zoom, sir. I see. The, okay. Outside the Zoom, you.
you take your ppt sir you open your ppt there sir you open your ppt there only okay then you go to csc sir uh, now yes sir it's okay now fine okay. now fine so now uh, ppt can now. be seen i can be heard as well yes yes sir you can right. both okay so um, yeah technical hack uh, technical uh, you know issues that we have okay see uh, the constitution don't don't look at the constitution uh, as only a law though it's mother of all laws uh, it's just not a document which establishes government but it's a document which is aimed at political social and economic change please uh, mark the words it is aimed at political social and economic change as we go on you will understand how the constitution aims at making this change okay so we have to see how it aims at making a political change a social change and economic change uh, through the provisions secondly the constitution of course if you want to make the change you cannot just make a law or pass provisions and and expect that the change will take place you will have to establish institutions which will make that change and you shall also have to initiate a process for that so you will find that as we go on that the constitution of india aims at making this political social and economic change further it has established institutions which would enable such a change and the processes which would enable such a change okay so uh, we should keep keep that in mind next question okay okay now uh, you see when it was decided that india would get independence and uh, you know government of india act of 1935 was passed um the question came up before the british as to how would india gain independence and how would a new constitution come in for that there was a mission which was established is called cabinet mission of mission to india of 1946 and on that their recommendation it was decided that a constituent assembly would be established of elected representatives from provincial legislative assemblies and princely states so under the 1935 act there were already elections and we already had representatives from provincial legislative assemblies and princely states as you know at that time there were princely states and the representatives of these assemblies and princely states were elected further to the constituent assembly and a constituent assembly was framed for for um, bringing in a new uh, new indian constitution and uh, indian independence act 1947 was passed by british parliament which gave which actually gave uh, legality to the establishment of constituent assembly uh, for um, it may be uh, interesting for uh, all to see that uh, i i happen to have uh, if you see the times of india of august 15 1947 uh, you will see the uh, photographs of uh, lord lord mountbatten uh, then uh, pandit nehru and uh, the famous speech of pandit nehru as we know uh, the trust uh, with destiny uh, uh, a famous speech uh, i am sure all of you know about that speech so the constituent assembly coming back to constituent assembly it had total 398 members various committees were constituted there was not only one committee because constituent assembly was a was a body consisting of 398 members they divided themselves into various committees and for our purposes the committee uh, which brought in or which drafted the constitution was a drafting committee and chairman as we all know is dr b r ambedkar one more important part of the constituent assembly is that it consisted of only one party and that was indian national congress because at that time there were no uh, there was no multi party there were no other parties indian national congress was the only party which was there in the constituent assembly now you may think that therefore uh, the constitution has come out from only one thought or one ideology now that is not true because indian national congress at that time also had people with various thought processes so you know uh, the constitution comes into into picture 
after considering thoughts of various people, though they all belong to Indian National Congress. Now, certain important dates, 26 November 1949, which, which is today, uh, why it is celebrated as Constitution Day? Because some articles of the Constitution came into force on 26 November 1949. Entire Constitution came into force on 26 January 1959. And 26, 29 January 1950 is considered to be 1950 is considered to be the first working day of government of India. Now, if there is anything which is most important, which one would mark in the constitution, is that it had a great, great impact of the Indian freedom movement. The entire chapter of fundamental rights, directive principles. Thereafter, what came as fundamental duties. See, you will find that if there was anything which was thought to be most important for this country, it was the freedom. It was the liberties. And therefore, when you see the fundamental rights, you will find that a lot of emphasis is given to, to right to equality, right to life, and the entire freedom article 19, which is, which is thought to be the most important article because that's what we fought for, that India became independent. Indian people wanted independence. We wanted Swaraj. And, and therefore, that assumed a great importance while making of the Constitution. It has 395 articles, well schedules, and it was amended up till now 103 times. Now, let me take a pause here. There are two views about amendments to the Constitution. Um, if you see the US Constitution, it has not been amended. Uh, it has been amended only, uh, you know, uh, very limited number of times. So there are always two views. One view is that if you amend the constitution every now and then, then you would you may dilute with it, and on the basis of majority you can bring in, okay, whatever you want in the constitution. Now, the other view is that well, constitution is a living document. Any law is a living document. Any law has to be changed as the society changes, and therefore you can you can uh, very well change even the constitution. Now, I am the one who belongs to the second uh, you know view that yes, any law, including the constitution, is a living document, uh, and and therefore people uh, should have a right of changing it as as per the needs. Of course, uh, we will when we go to Kesavan and the Bharti, the restriction on these changes also we will examine. But yes, there is nothing wrong in amending. Particularly, you need amendments in the constitution in a country of this nature, which is a newly born country, which is very heterogeneous uh, in its character. You have you know, people from, from speaking different languages, following different cultures, um, and a very heterogeneous uh, uh, cultures which have come together uh, in a unitary form, where you need to, to, to you know, amend the constitution so that this unitary form, the integrity of, of the country is preserved. It is considered to be one of the largest constitutions, written constitutions uh, of the world. The drafting went on from 1946 to 1949. Now, Dr. Ambedkar, when um, he, he uh, put on the floor the, the draft of the constitution, this is what he says. He says, this constitution is not the last word. There may have been, uh, and that's why you know he also said he also he also had the foresight that this may get amended. But this is what he also says. However, a good constitution may be, it is sure to turn out to be bad because those who are called to work it happen to be a bad lot, and vice versa. So he says we can make a very beautiful law, a very beautiful constitution, but its success will depend on people and how we make it work. So you know that remains. Uh, that is something which we need to keep in mind. And, and when you um, see the working of the constitution, you will find that there are uh, things which, uh, as Principal Jaisia said, we have continued with adult franchise. We have continued to be peaceful transition of power. But at the same time, uh, there, are, uh, there are problems in working of the constitution. Uh, so not everything is happy, but there are good and, and, and uh, bad points, which uh, you know, we have to think of. Now, nature of the constitution. 
See, Indian constitution is unique in the sense you can't call it federal nor call nor can you call it unitary. Now, a unitary constitution gives entire power to the center, while a federal constitution gives entire power to the states. Now, India is quasi-federal, quasi-unitary. There are powers which are there with the center. There are powers which are there with the state. In fact, there are powers which are there now even to municipal corporations, Zilla Parishad, Gram Panchayats. So it is not federal. Okay, It is, uh, uh, you can say, a blend or a quasi-federal or quasi-unitary. Unlike US, where it is considered to be more federal, powers are there more to the state than to the center. Or residuary power is always to the state. Whatever remains, like defense, okay, is will be will be with the center, and most of the other powers with will be with the state. And that's why you know uh, when you talk of U.S. Constitution, you will always have to see what the state says than what the center says. Anyways, how uh, we have uh, made it a blend, you will see that there is distribution of legislative powers. In in Indian Constitution, there are three three lists. One is called a, a central list. The subject matters which are there in the central list, only the central government can pass laws. Other is called state list, where state governments can pass laws in respect of those subjects. And there is a concurrent list in respect of which both center and state can pass laws. So there is distribution of legislative powers. It is not unitary. It is federal. There is distribution of revenue collection powers. Revenue can be collected by center, by the state, and again, this redistributed amongst the people. So again, there is distribution. There is central as well as state civil services. Governor is to be appointed by the president. There are emergency powers which are in the hands of the center. So if you see the provisions, you will find that there is a mixture. Some power is there with the, with the center. Some power is there with the state. And uh, the balance needs to be uh, kept between the center and the state. So it's quasi-federal, quasi-unitary. Now, three pillars of the democracy, and, and those are there in Indian constitution as well. One is legislature of the union, that is the parliament, with two houses, as we know, Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha, one directly elected, one indirectly elected. State legislatures also have a similar uh, similarly, two houses. Okay, then, uh, well, I'll take a pause here. Legislatures, as we know, are considered to be elected by the people, so they are the representatives of people. Executive, uh, the the uh, the ministry, and all those who work under the ministry. Okay, the whole of the secretariat the police machinery, the collectorate's machinery, all of them conduct, come under the executive. While legislature will make the laws, executive will execute them. Okay. They will be right. Then, of course, we will come to what is dear to all of us, judiciary. Okay. There is a central judiciary, uh, I mean, the union judiciary, in the sense that you have hierarchy of the judiciary is uh, coming from, uh, coming from, uh, you know, Munsip court or the magistrate's court, bottom, the high court, to the Supreme Court. Uh, judges are selected, as, as we know. And therefore, you know, I will just uh, here uh, recommend to you that you read a book by Alexander Bickel, whether judiciary can be seen to be a least dangerous branch, because, you know, legislature has the will of the people, it makes laws, executive um, executes the laws, uh, whether judiciary, uh, you know, uh, judiciary does not have power by itself. It has to wait for a dispute to come. Its task is dispute resolution. And therefore, whether it can be said to be least dangerous is a question which we'll try to answer as we go on. Then, as I said, um, Congress was the only majority party then. Now, before the constitution, there was a federal court. Okay, And appeals from federal court, federal court was the highest court of the land. And appeals from federal court used to go to the Privy Council in London. See, even now you will find that in the judgments of the Supreme Court or High Court, sometimes reference is made to the Privy Council judgments. Now, this is where it comes from. That at that time, our matters, Indian matters, would go finally by way of appeal to the Privy Council. And, and some of the judgments of Privy Council 
um, you know, are referred even now. Uh, in fact, the constitution says that Privy Council judgments are still law of the land if, of course, the Supreme Court of India has not commented or has not dealt with that particular point. Today, of course, most of the points are dealt with by the Supreme Court of India. So we refer to Supreme Court. But Supreme Court, in turn, many a times you will find, refers to the Privy Council judgments. Um, now, uh, I will come to the uh, next part before I, uh, yeah. Even declaration of emergency, we need not worry. Uh, after emergency, we need not worry. Uh, the preamble to the constitution. See, uh, preamble to any statute, more so in the constitution, will give you the objects of the constitution. It will tell you how the processes and the institutions will be set up as per the constitution. Let us read the preamble. The very first words and the last words of the preamble say that the source of this constitution and the preamble is, is the people of India. So we, the people of India, okay. Uh, now we had to, we have to emphasize on it because we decided that it is the people of India which who will decide for themselves what constitution, what type of constitution it wants. Okay. Further, it says having solemn resolve to constitute India into a sovereign. Again, okay. sovereign are the first words. We do not want any third or any third party to decide what laws we want, what policies we want. We want to be sovereign. We want to be kings of ourselves. People are the kings in this country. Okay. Socialist, the word which was inserted by way of amendment, uh, whether we are still socialist is something which needs to be debated. Secular. We have called ourselves a secular nation. There are countries of the world which don't call themselves secular. They belong to a particular religion. But Indian state is secular, right? It is supposed to be secular. Democratic Republic, which means adult franchise and, and uh, uh, all posts open to Indian citizens, irrespective of their caste, creed, sex, place of birth, uh, etc. Now, what is the object of the constitution? It is to secure what? Justice. Now, justice is not the justice that you and me see in the court. Justice includes social, economic, and political. So coming back to what I said in the beginning, that the constitution aims at change. And that change is not only um, economic, not only social, not only political. It is all social, economic, and political. Liberty, the most important for what we thought of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship. Equality of status and of opportunity. And, of course, to promote fraternity, assuring dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation. So the, the adoption of the constitution is made on 26th day of November 1949, as you can see, with many of the articles. Now we directly go to, I will, I will skip the uh, part two of the constitution, part one, uh, part two of the constitution, which is about citizenship. Part one is only introduction uh, of, of uh, the Constitution Union and its uh, territory. I will shift directly to the most important part of the Constitution, which is part three, fundamental rights. Now, uh, fundamental rights chapter, okay, uh, if you, uh, and I would recommend uh, everybody uh, who is uh, interested in Constitution to read, the Indian Constitution, Cornerstone of a Nation by Glanvin, Granville Austin. It's a book which tells you all that I spoke about uh, as far as making of the Constitution is concerned. And uh, since it's written by a foreign author, uh, it's a neutral commentary uh, of the Constitution. Of course, the best commentary ever written on the Constitution is that by, um, is uh, of course, Basu and uh, uh, Sirvai. Uh, now, coming to part three, we will just briefly see some of the articles, though not all. Okay. Uh, article 12 is only, it only refers to, uh, to generally to the definitions. We need not worry. Article 13 is important. 
it clearly says article 13 says that the laws which are inconsistent or in derogation of the fundamental rights which follow would be void okay now this will assume importance as we go along particularly when we see case bar and the bar okay now let's see what are the fundamental rights first part is about equality article 14 right to equality equality before law and equal protection of law every citizen is equal before law and has equal protection okay what follows are are uh, or or what follows is uh, springs from right to equality 15 prohibition of discrimination on the grounds of religion race caste sex or place of birth 16 equality of opportunity in matters of public employment uh, employment 17 abolition of untouchability 18 abolition of titles okay let me take a pause here see right to equality also aims at affirmative discrimination or affirmative action which means under these articles the legislature is allowed to discriminate in favor of backward class in favor of women in favor of children now why that discrimination is allowed that it cannot be said to be discrimination is affirmative action as is called in us parlance so that we to bring about equality you have to you see discriminate in favor of these people because equality would be non existent will not come into existence if you don't you know bring these people at the level of the others and therefore these articles allow positive discrimination reservation in favor of backward class women and children and and that cannot be said to be against equality it is in fact to bring about the equality then freedom protection of certain rights regarding freedom of speech it says all citizens shall have right one to freedom of speech and expression okay which includes freedom of press now freedom of media now even freedom of you know online content uh, and and what not to assemble peaceably and without arms to form associations or unions to move freely throughout the territory of india to reside and settle in any part of the territory of india and last to practice any profession or to carry on any occupation trade or business see these are i think fundamental to our existence in india if you want to exist okay or in india we consider that without these freedoms our lives will be meaningless if you don't have a right of freedom of speech and expression if you don't have right of moving free throughout the territory of india of settling down in any part of the country to practice any profession of your choice you see your very human existence would be at stake let me tell you in some of the countries of the world not now but before second world war many of these countries particularly communist countries did not have many of these rights okay even buying a xerox machine in ussr Uh, for buying a xerox machine yes sir you need a permission of the government because a xerox machine can spread you see information um, uh, in uh, uh, by just copying and that the government wanted to control so you know things were that bad okay article 20 production a protection in respect of conviction of offenses we need not worry too much about that article 21 is one of the most uh, important articles uh, of of the constitution Uh, which as we will see the supreme court has very innovatively used article 14 and article 21 article 21 if you read it a bare reading of it it says that no person can be deprived of his life or liberty without following the procedure established by law so if you read it may just mean to you that okay one's life or personal liberty cannot be taken away unless you follow the procedure established by law which means even kasab could not be hanged till the supreme court decided against him right so everyone knew uh, the video was very much there showing that he was guilty supreme court expanded this article and it said life here does not only mean a life of a human being of existence it means all that you need for meaningful existence so all that human beings need for human be- meaningful existence 
for existence which in which which would have uh, not only meaning a comfortable life is what is included in article 21 so then they started expanding this and including for example your life will be meaningless if you don't have edu education so right to education would come under article 21 at least till primary level if you don't have a good environment your life will be miserable so environmental rights are included under article 21 so on and so forth so life is given a very meaningful uh, a very expanded meaning by the supreme court we will deal with some of it then 22 of course we saw is protection of arrest against arrest and detention in certain cases then right against exploitation protection of uh, prohibition of traffic in human beings and forced labor uh, child labor prohibition of employment of children in factories 24 then right to freedom of religion uh, freedom of conscience and free profession practice and propagation of religion freedom to manage religious affairs freedom as to payment of taxes for promotion of any particular religion freedom as to attendance at religious instruction or religious worship in certain educational institutions so uh, you are free to to believe in what you don't uh, you want to believe you are also free to be a non believer okay under these articles then cultural and educational rights protection of interests of minorities protection of minorities uh, rights of minorities establish and administer educational institutions the whole educational um, educational case law which has developed starting from uh, from uh, really uh, tmp foundation uh, or even even prior to that you know many of these cases actually came from karnataka because karnataka at that time allowed capitation in 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 fees and uh, you know all that case law which started uh, from uh, from uh, karnataka and and came up to tmp foundation uh, all of that has taken place under um, article 29 30 and of course 14 uh, and 21 of the constitution uh, now i will again come back uh, to the fundamental rights uh, but we will also have to see that the next part four uh, talks of directive principles of state policy now when Dr. Amb uh, now, you know, many of you would know that while fundamental rights can be enforced under Article 32 or 226 of the Constitution uh, by filing writ petitions in the High Court or Supreme Court, as the case may be, directive principles of the state policy cannot are not justiciable. They cannot be enforced in courts of law. But and and when Dr. Ambedkar was asked this question, then why have directive principles if you can't enforce them? This is what Dr. Ambedkar said. He said that don't think that only those provisions which can be enforced in courts of law are, are the ones which are needed in a constitution. A constitution also needs provisions which can be said to be our goals. So he said, when you are going to vote in elections, keep in mind these directive principles and then give votes. Keep in mind the parties and people who are committed to these directive principles and vote for them okay uh, those who you think are 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 committed to them use them or or or, or uh, you know use the directive principles to decide on your voting of course today i don't see that is happening but this is what dr ambedkar said secondly though directive principles are not justiciable they can be used to give meaning to the constitution particularly to give meaning to fundamental rights. And that is what the Supreme Court has done in many generations. So the utility of directive principles is very much there. Now, what are the directive principles? Mainly, um, you know, 38, it starts from 38. State to secure a social order for promotion of welfare of the people. Certain principles of policy to be followed by the state. Equal justice and free legal aid. This is important for our 39A, that it aims at equal justice and free legal aid for people of India. Then organization of village fund sites, right to work, to education, and public assistance to in certain cases. Provision for just and human conditions of work and maternity leave. Living wage, participation of workers in management of industry. Uniform civil code, it's a dream. It has not come true, but it's, it's a dream which is there in directive principle. Provision for free and compulsory education, 
now that has become a fundamental right as we know uh, after the judgment of supreme court in uh, mohini jain uh, and other judgments uh, it, uh, article 21 is added and it has now become a fundamental right up to primary education then promotion of educational and economic interests of scheduled castes scheduled tribes other weaker sections duty of the state to raise the level of nutrition and the standard of living and to improve public health organization of agriculture and animal husbandry protection and improve improvement of environment and safeguarding of forests and wildlife protection of monuments and places of and objects of national importance separation of judiciary from executive promotion of, promotion of international peace and security okay. so these are the directive principles of state policy now often times we talk of rights but not duties of course duties are also not justiciable but what are the fundamental duties 51a which was added by way of amendment it says it shall be the duty of every citizen of india to abide by the constitution and respect its ideals and institutions and national flag and the national anthem so whichever religion you may belong to whichever caste you may belong to it is better that along with your religious books keep the constitution because you are to abide by it constitution should always be by the side of you know whichever uh, religious book it may be bhagavad gita it may be quran it may be uh, the bible by that side we should always have a constitution to cherish and follow the noble ideals which inspired our national struggle for freedom to uphold and protect the sovereignty unity and integrity of india to defend the country and render national service when called upon to do so so if need be if we are called to defend the nation even in the army it comes to we should all be ready and willing to join the army to defend this country and the integrity and sovereignty of this country you know in fact in many countries of the world before second world war one had to compulsorily okay take after your education take training of army so that in case of need you could be drafted it was called drafting to the army even if you belong to any profession they could draft you to the army of course later on this this uh, uh, was removed because of the pressure of human rights anyway to promote harmony and the spirit of common brotherhood amongst all the people of india transcending religious linguistic and regional or, or sectional diversities to renounce practices derogatory to the dignity of women to value and preserve the rich heritage of our composite culture to protect and improve the natural environment including forests lakes rivers wildlife and to have compassion for living creatures to develop scientific temper humanism and the spirit of inquiry and reform i always feel this country need, we need to develop scientific temper india lacks scientific temper there are so many superstitions which go on 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 many things that i think we need to curb it by developing scientific temper to safeguard the public property and to adjure violence this was very important you see uh, dr ambedkar always believed that you you will have a right of vegetation but a right of vegetation without violence gandhi ji always believed that right of vegetation without violence non violence and non cooperation to strive towards excellence in all spheres of individual and collective activity so that so that the national that the nation constantly rises to higher levels of endeavor and achievement so these are very important fundamental rights official language hindi in devanagari script but english is continued for all official purposes under article 342 now i will come to uh, what is called as a basic structure doctrine and how it came into force and since most of the students will be law students uh, a judgment which has completely changed the way constitution of india is is, is thereafter uh, interpreted a judgment which came from from the state of kerala kesavananda bharati was the state of kerala now you know um, before i get into this judgment um, history uh, to this extent is important when india became independent uh, the government of india wanted to see to it that it it uh, brought about a socialist change meaning thereby that lands they wanted the lands in this country to be equitably distributed not equal and therefore many states and the union passed what are called as land reform laws now 
in kerala also uh, for example uh, you know in in the state of punjab there were land reform laws in fact a judgment which came before case one and the bharti golakna came out of a judgment uh, came out of punjab where land reform laws of punjab uh, they appropriated case uh, golakna's 500 acres of 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 land uh, and that gave rise to golakna judgment golakna challenge it etc i will not go into that because uh, you know shankari prasad golakna are uh, are um, you know all considered in case of an andamat so kerala passed uh, legislation uh, for land reforms okay and uh, certain land of mutt uh, i know that uh, you know even in karnataka there are a lot of mutts particularly to lingayat community so there were mutts in kerala also and swami uh, keswananda who was head of the mutt the, the uh, said uh, he challenged this kerala government land reform legislation under various various articles of the constitution uh, right to religion was part of it uh, because there is one more provision of the constitution which you should know that under the constitution if laws are passed and they are put in the ninth schedule then those laws the constitution says cannot be challenged in the courts of law okay so that provision was also uh, there uh, and some part of uh, what was challenged was put in ninth schedule of course now the law is settled though you put it in the ninth schedule it is the court which will decide whether it was proper for you to put it in ninth schedule or not now it's a very interesting case uh, which was you know argued by uh, none other than eminent jurist nani palkiwala for uh, swami keswananda sirvai argued for the government so there were stalwarts who 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 took up this case it was heard by 13 judges Uh, uh meaning there by at that time all the judges of the supreme court it was heard for 68 days okay. uh and in this uh, you know funny as uh, not funny interesting as it, it may appear to you uh, when palkiwala was arguing uh, uh, on the first day uh, he was trying to propound this basic structure doctrine he was trying to convince the judges that uh, power of amendment to the constitution cannot be unprecedented you cannot even allow the parliament to have unlimited unbridled unrestricted power to amend the constitution there has to be something called as a basic structure and that basic structure cannot be altered even by the parliament this was what alkiwala was trying to argue but the judges were not impressed at all they were saying no is there anything that you are saying which is there in the constitution which talks of basic structure what is basic structure where is basic structure we don't we don't buy this argument so palkiwala uh, a man of that eminence was also uh, uh, you know taken to task by the judges judges were just not accepting this argument and uh, you know as a lawyer you should always know that you know you should have that fire in the belly even if a judge is not accepting your argument you know you should know how to convince a judge by using you know using your skills to your uh, ability by taking the judges from here there trying different uh, uh, angles of the argument and palkiwala then invited the judges attention to a german doctrine okay which was used at that time uh, by a german thinker and also used thereafter by another constitutional thinker i think i don't get his name uh, and using this the palkiwala said look at this in germany this is used in in india also a constitutional expert has uh, used this please understand what i am trying to say and uh, it was at the end of the first day that the judges started buying his argument okay though there were many questions about this doctrine so he had to argue for the whole first day just to allow the judges just to allow him uh, uh, to get the permission to expound on this doctrine so you know it wasn't easy uh, but now you know today this basic structure doctrine is the law of the land and uh, it is used by supreme court every now and then i will come to it ultimately this doctrine came to be accepted by a very thin majority seven judges accepted it six judges did not accept it okay and um, what this doctrine in simple words it says constitution can be amended by parliament it can be amended even 
any part of the constitution can be amended provided it does not change the basic structure okay you can amend the constitution the parliament has power to amend there is a, a, a article which allows parliament to amend the constitution but by amending you cannot change the basic structure of the constitution the immediate question will be what is basic structure answer is nobody knows okay uh, nobody knows what is basic structure because the constitution does not tell you what is the basic structure so the court said we will decide what is basic structure so see now going back to uh, what uh, what um uh, uh, i said at the beginning is the court least dangerous no in fact course is most dangerous court is to decide what is basic structure and by judgments it has decided parliamentary democracy fundamental rights judicial review secularism are all held to be basic structure but that is not it it can be decided from time to time so it's a legal fiction okay um now thereafter the courts have used this basic structure doctrine okay uh, for Uh, and actually the courts have now diluted it and have used it even for legislative challenges take the example of sp gupta cases the national judicial accountability committee bill cases where the court has used this basic structure of course in the limited time i will not go into it it but this change this gave a very powerful weapon in the hands of the court to for, uh, to judicially review any law and any amendment to the constitution so this was as far as basic structure then uh, uh, i think in the limited time i have uh, what also gave rise uh, in courts is public interest litigation where they relaxed locus standing normally the rule in courts is that if you want to go to the court your right must be affected but now under the constitution your rights need not be affected uh, you can take up somebody else's right and as a public spirited organization or individual you will be allowed access under pi um uh, and normal rule of locus standi is lax um uh, article 14 and 21 is you know very innovatively used uh, and you know pioneers are of course justice p p n bhagwati and b r krishna iyer okay so if you see the the way the indian judiciary has worked under the constitution 50 to 70 is it was conservative and pro government 75 emergency turned around everything after 70 and after case one and the bharti okay a uh, judicial activism through you know uh, through pil uh, through judicial review is what is uh, the norm of the day 226 and 32 are used by the constitution okay okay so you know coming back to the constitution they have created a legislative branch an executive branch and the judiciary branch and the uh, judicial branch okay okay um i did not go into these things now okay uh before i um, i think um, go into uh, the very conclusion of the whole thing uh i will just kind of summarize if you go into the constitution we have seen part 3 fundamental rights we have seen part 4 directive principles 4a fundamental duties thereafter okay the other part so up till part 4a you will see that those those are objects of the constitution those are uh, goals of the constitution those are the rights of the people thereafter how they will be put into practice is what you see in part 5 where it starts with the union which is in that chapter 1 is executive president and vice president uh, then chapter 2 parliament how parliament will come into existence how it will conduct its business then chapter 3 would be legislative powers of the uh, of of the president chapter 4 union judiciary as we saw chapter 5 is controller and auditor general of india then part 6 is about the states it repeats the same format first the states executive legislature and uh, the judiciary then of course the subordinate courts then uh, the other parts are actually the uh, residuary parts where you will find um, is is um, union territories panchayats municipalities then there is <clears throat> by way of addition cooperative societies chapter uh, 9b is recently added then there is a chapter about scheduled 
schedule uh, and and tribal areas then as i, I as i uh, told you earlier there is a chapter on relations between the union and the states about legislative and administrative and as as i sub, as, as i uh, pointed out that there is distribution of power so it is neither unitary nor federal uh, which will be seen even in part 12 which is about finance property contracts and suits uh then uh under under this part uh, you will also find that the right to property which was a fundamental right is now moved here then part 13 is trade commerce intercourse within the territory of india part uh, 14 as i as i said is about services that is public services uh, how public uh, central services uh, examinations commissions would be uh a commission was established state services was also established then there will be tribunals elections how elections are to be conducted and and and, and establishment of election commission then uh, special provisions relating to certain classes then there is a chapter of official languages then uh, after official languages there is an important chapter of emergency provisions which as we all know uh, there was a dark era when these provisions were used and uh, now you know uh, there was uh, even the supreme court at that time did not satisfy the test of time uh, uh, dmk jabalpur case uh, so that is how then there is a miscellaneous and and last article 368 uh, amendment to the constitution which we have examined and thereafter there are transitory provisions um, so this is you know to take you through the constitution uh, there are of course some schedules uh, what i think as students you should concentrate on more uh, and students of law is one fundamental rights the chapter on fundamental rights judgments under that kesavananda bharati judgment uh, which is crucial <clears throat> and uh, of course how judiciary has functioned how judgments of the courts have changed their direction from being pro conservative to uh, you know taking up challenges against government against executive against legislature uh, to sum up uh, i think uh, what dr ambedkar said uh, is what, what we should always keep in mind uh, he said while you know uh, keeping on the floor the draft of the constitution that on 26 january 1950 we are give, going to enter into a life of contradictions it's a life of contradictions in politics we have equality i mean at least uh, because of adult franchise and in social and economic life we'll have inequality in politics we'll be recognizing the principle of one man one vote and one value uh, and one vote one value in our social and economic life we shall by reason of our social and economic structure continue to deny the principles of one man one vote so see you are if your social and economic structure is not not brought out uh, or is not equitable then your political equality will be meaningless why how long shall we continue to live this life of contradictions how long, long shall we continue to deny equality in our social economic life if we continue to deny it for long okay we will do so only by putting our political democracy in peril so you see if you don't have social and economic structure your your uh, political equality by adult franchise will be meaningless because people will be Who will be voting if they are not socially and economically well equipped? They will not be able to vote the way a vibrant democracy would. We must therefore remove this contradiction at the earliest possible moment, or else those who suffer from inequality will blow up the structure of political democracy, which this assembly has so laboriously built. Up. He says, if you don't bring about and concentrate on social and economic structure and equitable distribution of wealth. equitable distribution of uh, welfare then your political democracy will will be challenged uh, by uh, the social and economic inequalities and you see that even today in some parts of this country we see this happening uh, all the time and therefore um, i think if constitution is to be understood it is to be understood as a living document as a document which aims uh, as i said not only at political change by just giving one man one vote but at a change which has to be social and economic and it has to be brought out through the constitution by 
not only the executive and the legislature by the judiciary so it is a duty of all the three pillars of the constitution to see to it that we bring about social political social and economic change i think i will take a pause here because i think uh, uh, the time which was given to me was uh, of an hour uh, as winston churchill said courage is what it takes to stand up and speak i'm not standing up or but i'm speaking but courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen so i thank everybody who has sat down and listened to me uh, to be courageous equally courageous as i am thank you thank you sir for enlightening all of us on the constitution day and its importance i now call upon jyoti hiramat ma'am to propose vote of thanks Uh, before uh, uh, Jyoti Ma'am takes over, uh, I wish uh, once again I thank uh, Dr. Shah for sparing his valuable time. Yes, sir. We know that the topic that has been given to you is so vast, and uh, time was given was uh, very short. And we look forward for your association in coming days because this pandemic has given us an excellent opportunity where we can sit in our own places and still we can end the challenges with uh, the lots of input from the people like you. Sure, thank you. Look forward for you because all of us we have got good number of admissions today for both our uh, both the courses and uh, the students are very enthusiastic and uh, we we'll definitely look forward for you again another lecture especially on the enforcement of fundamental rights by the judiciary which that could help them academically as also and also understanding the Indian Constitution. Probably in a in ten or fifteen days time I will once again schedule one more uh, lecture from you sir and I wait you. Sure. Thank you very much for accepting your invitation. And thank you, sir. Thank you. I now will leave it to Jyoti Ma'am. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. Uh, before uh, actually uh, expressing my gratitude, I would like to quote Dr. Ambedkar's uh, statement that the Constitution is not a mere lawyer's document, but it is a vehicle of life, and its spirit is always the spirit of age. and that's why on this occasion let us take the oath to remember our fundamental duties we always care for our rights but it is our duty to remember our fundamental duties as given in our constitution and try to follow it on this occasion uh, and on this particular day of constitution day i would like to specially first thanks to the karnataka state legal service authority bar council of india and karnataka state law university hubali in supporting us to host this event on behalf of the management principal sir staff and students i specially thanks uh, guest speaker dr santosh sir sir who readily accepted our invitation and shared his knowledge on this particular vast topic but in short timing thank you sir I also thank our principal sir for continuous support in hosting this webinar. Thank you, sir. I also thanks. Uh, uh, I also express my thanks to my student Ram Kishan for giving us technical support and Mansi for being the master of ceremony. Thank you, Mansi. And I also special thanks our freshers who joined today uh, for this webinar and made this webinar a successful event. I once again thanks all of you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. What an informative webinar it was. Thank you all for being a part of this webinar. Thank you once again. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, sir, if you uh, if you don't mind, uh, if you could share your PPT so that I can put it in my library so that the students can. Uh, sure, sure, sure. I will send it to on, on your mail. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good day. Sure. Yes. Sure. Bye bye. Father. <laughs> <laughs> आम्ही सोडू शकतो एक लेक्चर सोडके
तुझा आवाज आलाय कोणाचा तुझा तुझा वेळ मिटिंग थोडा मारतात